I think uh, we're asked to do this often because I think we create the most, uh, I'm assuming. Um, we have a lot to choose from. Uh, and so I, I chose this one, because, and I think I haven't presented this before. So, but if I have, I'm sorry. <laughs> but we did it at our CATH conference only, so I think that's it. So I'll go through some of this stuff quickly since we're behind time. Um, oops, sorry. Basically, it's a 78-year-old woman um, who's, who's high risk uh, for surgery, mainly based on frailty, uh, debilitation. Um, she had a prior mechanical mitral valve uh, due to endocarditis in 1997. Um, she had low flow, low gradient uh, AS, or EF, EF was down uh, to around 30%, peak velocity 3.3, valve area around 0 0.8. Um, her RV was also down a little bit, uh, and PA pressures were up in, in the 50s. She, her STS was 5.6, but she really was a high-risk candidate uh, and really felt more from frailty and debilitation standpoint, uh, but, but uh, act, uh, functional and active, but sort of uh, you know, d didn't pass the eyeball test, so to speak. Uh, her coronary angiogram, um, you, can see the, you can see the mechanical mitral valve uh, working appropriately. Um, there's no significant coronary disease. Uh, on the pre-procedural CT, uh, the, uh, you know, the vessels are somewhat calcified, a little bit tortuous, but th they're, they're large, so there are no issues. Um, you see the woman was at 5'5", 127 pounds, for, at a BMI of uh, 21. And, you know, it's sort of always su surprising when these patients have such a large annulus. I mean, she's not, a, she's not a tall woman. BMI is 21. Her annular area was 704, perimeter of around 96. Uh, sinus, sinuses were large, um, you know, 34 to 37. STJ was around 26. Uh, sinus height was, uh, was uh, adequate as well. You can see the coronaries, the STJ height was 28. Uh, so really a big root. Um, and the coronaries left mean 16, RCA was at 25. So our, our plan, and we've sort of, you know, we do a mix of conscious sedation and uh, general anesthesia. And this was early in our experience with doing really large valves, and especially even now with, you know, we've done valves close to 800. Uh, we do all those patients with TE guidance. Um, and so the plan here was general anesthesia and to do a TE uh, balloon first. We um, used a true balloon uh, in this case. Uh, and those of you that have seen a true balloon is basically uh, eight individual balloons that are connected. The central lumen is open. Uh, it has a fabric skirt on the outside. The, the concept basically is that you have flow through the balloon uh, as you, uh, even after you're inflated. If you're doing for standalone BAV, you can do prolonged inflations. You can do a minute inflation, a minute and a half. It really depends on their LVDP and their heart rate. If the heart rate's 50, you can't do a long inflation. If the heart rate's 100, you get away with longer inflations. You know, question was, this was early in our experience as well. We thought, you know, someone with a low EF, uh, RV dysfunction, we can avoid pacing, uh, let's do a true balloon, uh, what was the idea. So this is what we saw after the BAV. Um, I don't know if I can point, but I think it's pretty visible there. <laughs> yeah, so I don't think I need to point. Um, you see this thing flapping around. Um, and you see, and it, it looks like on, on the 3D, it's denuded endothelium from the aorta, uh, which looks like it's attached at the STJ. Um, and so we, 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 I don't know what people would do, and, and we can discuss this afterwards. So we'd already had a sheath up. We're planning a sapien. Theoretically, you know, a core valve at this point may be better able to, to pin this. I don't know if that's the case, because, but just because of a longer frame. Um, but we had already had the, and also it, it would have, you know, at 95, 96, I'm not sure I would have wanted to do that. I think we would have taken additional, uh, you know, other things that wouldn't work. So at this point, we, we decided to proceed, and we went ahead, and we were hoping that we'd, we'd pin it uh, against something and, and decide at that point what to do with it. Um, so we, we did a 29-millimeter Sapien III. Um, the you can, you, valve was unfortunately deployed a little bit low. Um, po you know, the final deployment was about 4 millimeters below the annulus, and I think most of us are trying to really get to 0 to 2, and this was uh, definitely a little bit low. Um, but there wasn't much AI. There was no AI, and there were no issues except this. This is what our echocardiographer finds. The flap managed to go into the left main uh, uh, before deployment. So now we have this flap which was flapping around. Now it's not flapping around, but now it's in the left main. Um, and uh, it, there was no hemodynamic consequences. This was literally, if we were doing this case awake, we wouldn't notice any of this, by the way. So we, this is because we had TE, which is, yeah, I know, I'm like, damn it. Because <laughs> now, now you're like staring at this and we're like, what do we do? Um, we couldn't leave it alone just because we're an interventional cardiologist and we can't leave anything like this alone. So we decided to image it in every which way. 
Um, but we, you see the coronary. You can see it. It looks like left main dissection, but it's not. Um, it's an aortic dissection that went flat that went to left main. Uh, you see on, on Ivis here, uh, pullback, you'll see. Uh, just time, maybe I'll just skip that, but you, you start to see some of the tissue. But basically, you see tissue floating in the left main. But the left main lumen is large. Uh, you know, in the end, we, we decided to stent it up against the wall. Um, and in some ways, this might have been a better option for her because now it's not flapping around. Now it's pinned on both sides in the STJ and in the left main, so it can't uh, embolize anywhere. So we put a 4.0 by 28 Synergy stent uh, and post dilated with a 5.0 balloon. Um, we, she was asleep. We weren't sure if there's other things. We, I'm not sure if this was the right decision or not, but we did a cerebral angio. We, we didn't see anything. Um, you know, she was sort of a frail lady. She got a huge right arm hematoma from an IV that they might have nicked a small artery. Um, but and she's been on you know aspirin and ticagrelor. Um, she was you know we had antiplatelets because of the stent now, and she was on heparin for a mechanical valve. She had mild dysarthria. The neurology thought it might have been a brainstem ischemic lesion. It fully recovered. We couldn't get an MRI because she has an ICD. Uh, and she eventually fully recovered with, with a nice big arm. Her right arm was twice the size of her left. It eventually all resolved, and she, she got discharged on post-op day nine. You know, I'm not going to go through this in the interest of time. I think all of us have these thoughts. You know, this is probably she had abnormal tissue. She's a small woman with an annulus of 700. Um, it's just out of proportion. Uh, and we, it sort of our thought was there's probably some tissue. With the use of the true balloon, which has some edges, maybe uh, lifted and denuded some endothelium, uh, was the other thought as well. Thanks. If you had to grade. Oh, yeah. Shashil, anything you would have done different in 2017, distal protection, no predilatation, right. knowing what you know now, looking back, anything you would have? I mean, I, I'm a b big believer in embolic protection, so I, I, would, I, would, I would protect. Yeah. Um, I think the sizing uh, it limits us to a uh, 29S3 at this point. There's nothing different. I wouldn't use the true balloon. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, in this type of scenario, I don't. I don't. You know what? I, I honestly, I shouldn't badmouth it and then say that's the cause. I don't know. Right. But you know, if I have to retrospectively say what are the potential, it does have a little bit of an edge to it. So in this patient, maybe it moved up and it, it, it got some of the endothelium. I'm not convinced that's the case. Uh, but that that's that's the only thing. I mean, and not not doing a valvoplasty obviously mm -hmm. would be yeah. with the other. So, That's what we think, yeah. Yeah, because I think it was flapping around. I think the sapien got caught on it yeah. as it was coming around. Yeah. yeah, and we, you know, the thing is, as we were deploying, we, we, in retrospect, didn't really focus on that. We could have looked at it on TEE. I'm not sure we could have done anything different, even if we had seen it, uh, but we didn't really notice it at the time. But I suspect that's what we did. Well, that's a great case. Why don't we move on? Okay. Ted's got one. Um, 